ask you, um, and thanks for starting the, the recording, Barbara. And so Roya, if I could just start with you and ask you to give us a little overview of um, your work with NEO. All right, so first of all, hello to everybody. And again, I'm very sorry for the delay. Um, so NEO is, um, I, I started off NEO being a, um, an adult crafting space where people can come in and essentially make stuff and meet people. And I've kept stuff as, as ambiguous as it is. So there's no pressure on having to create something that's perfect. Um, you're just there for the joy of creation and meeting new people while you're doing that. So it's sort of like building a community of people that, um, that just want to hang out and, and, and do something with their hands while they're doing that. Um, so it's a juggle between, uh, between um, actual crafting material that they're learning and the experience itself that they walk out with and um, meeting people and creating a community. So that's in a nutshell what NAO is. Thank you so much. Um, Rosanna, could I come to you and ask the same question, please? Could you start off by just yes. giving us an introduction to yourself and to Sparkle Lab? Absolutely. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rosanna, and I founded Sparkle Lab Design and Innovation Hub um, 10 years ago in the Philippines. And the goal was to um, create a research and development space that would imagine the future of learning, um, where learning would be engaging, where it would be fun, um, where there would be a community and kids and teens would fall in love um, with learning and become lifelong learners. Uh, so we started off as a little um, house with two rooms and um, kids came over and we... Um, started offering programs around that centered around things that kids love. So we had a program called Game Makers, which was on game design and development. Everything from board games to games on Scratch, and then later, um, you know, escape room games, virtual reality experiences. We had um, a program called the Toy Mill, um, which was making toys, but also learning about material science. And... Um, basically physically physical computing um, and IoT. Um, we had a program that was initially conceived for girls to get into tech, and it was called Stitches and Circuits. So a lot of it was um, wearable technology, fashion, e-tech styles. And then um, when the boys saw what the possibilities were, they all signed up for the classes as well, which is actually super great. Um, we had a robotics um, workshop called Spark and another program called Get Real, which was basically um, new frontiers in storytelling. So we did everything from um, 2D animations and stop motion animation to documentary storytelling, um, filmmaking, um, and uh, reimagining the experience of reading books. And um, what we learned was that the kids really loved it. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we had, um, you know, 3D printers and it was a maker space, but beyond that, it was really, I guess, a community of kids who loved hanging out and making things together. Um, so uh, in the course of our work, we came up with a suite of after-school programs and summer camps, and eventually our own school called Discovery Academy of Innovation, um, which is now open for preschoolers through first graders, um, and building that kind of one step at a time using uh, Sparkle Lab's unique kind of methodology and pedagogy towards um, learning. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for those introductions. Um, now, I've got some questions that um, I'd love to ask the pair of you, and um, we're going to go into those in just a moment. But I just want to um, remind everyone that um, the spirit of these talks is a, is a community discussion. And uh, we, we love to hear from all of the audience as well, um, whether it's to ask questions or whether it's to share your own experience. So um, please do um, feel free to uh, put your hand up um, if you've got something um, that you'd like to ask or, or tell us about. Um, so I'm struck that in those introductions, um, Roya and Rosanna, you both mentioned um, the importance of community. And um, that's something that 
um, is perhaps not always um, easy to reconcile with with having a business model um, that works. And so I wanted to just ask you to explain a little bit more about that, please. Roya first. Um, so I'm not sure about it working, <laughs> if I'm being honest, but no, no, no. Um, I think I think the best way to view this is to, to understand and reconcile yourself with being in it for the long haul. Um, instant gratification does not come in, like, in, 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 in quick turnover in terms of like money and cash flow. That does not happen when you're trying to build a community. Um, so if you're okay with that going in and you understand that going in, it helps, it helps set um, realistic expectations for everybody. And then with building the community itself, it removes the experience um, from being from being something about the makerspace itself and what people do to being a solely um, experience centric environment. And then you built that up from the moment uh, somebody sends a message asking about what's happening in the studio up until they leave and if there's like any follow up that happens. So it goes from being a business uh, like a service to it to an experience centric service. That makes sense. Thank you. And, and Rosanna, um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the same question about how you reconcile the importance of the community aspect with the business model. Yeah, so I'm trying to think about it. Um, yeah, so um, I guess when we started, um, there was obviously, you know, in the back of my mind, a pressing need to make um, the lab, I guess, economically viable, right? Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, when you talk about business models, um, understanding the community's needs and their desires um, and is, is inextricably linked to how successful you will be as a business, right? Um, so for us, um, Sparkle Lab really is this R&D space. And when we think about the programs and services we began to offer, we had the children and families at the center of our design process and what we do, right? And so understanding your constituents, what they're passionate about, um, but also gaps, I guess, um, it's in what's offered in a local setting, Um is what makes the business successful in a way, right? Um, because you're creating um, content and programs that are relevant and meaningful for the community, right? And so, you know, um, inadvertently, that's what makes it successful. So for instance, being in tune to the needs of kids and teens and what they were passionate about and really having this kind of playful, interest-driven pedagogy um, allowed us to have not just a lot of kids, um, but kids and families who started advocating for us and talking to, with talking about Sparkle Lab among their friends and families, right? And so we began to grow. Um, also keeping kind of the kids and families and community at the heart of the design experience allowed us to create such successful programs that we actually had a really high, like 97% re-enrollment rate. So the kids wouldn't just come for one wow. program, they would keep on coming back, right? That's and really um, yeah, and at first it was actually, you know, kids trying new and different programs. But eventually what happened was they um, signed up for programs they already went through just to be in this kind of creative and nurturing environment, right? So um, I think um, just being in tune to who you want to serve, right, and what their needs are inevitably strengthens the business model that you have. That definitely makes sense. Um, and Roya, I saw you nodding some of the time um, at what Rosanna was saying there. 100, 100% with being in tune to, to who you want to serve um, is, is uh, uh, like the best way to go about it. Yes. And then having them at the center of everything that you're designing, that is, that is it. Okay. 
So could you just tell us a little bit about the kind of the nuts and bolts of the business model that you have now? Like what are the different service offerings that you have and who are they aimed at? And, you know, who is it that actually pays for them? Okay, should I start? Yeah, this, please. Okay. Um, so individuals pay for them. We're, we're a business to consumer. Uh, we also often host a lot of corporate activities that would like to come in. It's sort of like a different take on team building where crafting brings people together. Um, and, and so it also helps with like businesses because on a crafting table, everybody's knowledge is equal and that is zero. So it's like it levels out the learning experience for everybody. Uh, we kind of differ from from um, a lot of uh, a lot of people um, or like um, different uh, different studios in the area because we cater to specifically to adults and that and that helps them feel more at ease. Um, if you've taken the time to um, to 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 carve out some me time, um, you want to be in a place that caters specifically to adults, and that's something that we do. Um, so that's in terms of who do we cater to um and it's just it's just we offer lots of different crafting activities from from basic carpentry to creating your own uh, copper pipe lamps to um i don't want to like go into all the details to like a fiber arts such as macrame and punch needling and weaving um to to candle making and concrete pouring so it's like it's a very vast variety and people can come in and just try their hands at what they want to do we also incubate a lot of small businesses. So the idea behind Nao came from, um, I, I have best friends that start up uh, co-working spaces and these are essentially targeted to business people. And I was kind of like jealous because why are there co-working spaces for business people where you have like all the basic amenities in there, but there isn't something like that for creatives. So if you want to try your hand at candle making and starting your own candle making business, there's no way for you to know if this is for you or not without having to go in and making the initial uh, financial burden in the beginning. So what we do with small businesses is, well, come try your hand. If you like it and um, get out your first batch and if you're happy with it and, and if business is going good, then you can make the financial commitment to yourself and go in and buy all the things that you need. But for the time being, come in, learn the know-how from us and start your own line and, and go. Um, so that helps a lot of small businesses. Um, and we love to cater to women-owned businesses. Um, so so that's, that's basically um, the mini nuts and bolts of nail fantastic thank you rosanna can i ask the same question to you please i'm guessing that with your focus on children it's less business focused um but uh yeah i'd love to hear what your different um service offerings are and who pays for them yeah so um you know when sparkle lab first started um it really um our revenues were from after school programs and summer camps, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was actually quite nice because we had a number of kids, quite a few who would pay in full, right? Um, and then we had a few kids who could pay basically um, whatever they wanted. And then a lot of kids, again, who came in for free. And um you know, just um, being able to have kind of like these workshops that were three hour long and turnover, right? We were able to accommodate enough kids who paid in full um, that it kind of supported the kids who could only pay for half or come in for free. Um, and it pretty much ran that way for the first, um, I would say, seven or eight years or so. Um, however, um, as we tried to expand, um, one of the things that we realized was that while we were successful in having um, summer camps and then programs on the weekends, um, fewer and fewer kids came to us after school because of the context of Philippine education. So um, a lot of students um, go to school till about three or four. And in the Philippines, there's a tutoring is a huge market, right? So after school, mm -hmm. instead of doing things like ballet and playing the cello or doing sports or even coming to Sparkle Lab, it would be more academic reinforcement, right? Um, and so 
that made it difficult for us to sustain ourselves um, during the school year. Um, you know, eventually um, we transitioned into um, creating our own school for several reasons, I guess. One was because the education system in the Philippines, like in quite a, quite a few places, is quite broken. So there's a lot of focus on memorization and skill and drill and kind of like broke, broke memorization. And um, so it was wanting to impact that sector. Um, a lot of the Sparkle Lab parents and kids told us that, you know, kids love coming to Sparkle Lab, but they hate going to school. So could we make an impact um, where kids spend most of their waking hours? So that was one. And I guess the second is when you look at parents spending on education, it really is focused on core, which is schooling. And then you have enrichment programs, which is basically tutoring or kumon. And then you have luxury programs, which unfortunately we fell into that category. Um, and so in order to sustain our work, it made sense to transition into a school. Um, now, the business model of a school uh, is quite different from running after school programs and summer camps. And I think... Um, one of the most striking things is just the amount of capex involved, right? And because you're spending uh, so much on creating the infrastructure for the school and buying materials um, and technology, then it inevitably drives the price of tuition up, right? So yeah. we're at this juncture where, you know, we actually reach a lot more kids through Sparkle Labs after school programs and summer camps, and it was a lot more egalitarian because the basically the amount of capital needed to create the school had to drive tuition fees up, right? Um, so then the question is, how do you kind of scale this model where you can reach more kids, right? But at lower costs. And that's something that, you know, we're still trying to explore and think about and discover. Okay, great. That's that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm curious if you could just say a little bit more about the um, the capex that you mentioned. Is that primarily in sort of fixed assets like buildings and things, or is it also time to develop the curricula? Um, uh, yeah. So the capital costs are basically rent, right? Okay. Yeah, um, the buildings. And when you rent out the space here, you basically have to fit it out. So it's a lot of construction and building um there's furniture right so like chairs and tables and sensory and then there's toys there's books there's tech that you want to incorporate um and then you have like kind of like the overhead costs so water electricity internet and then obviously there are operating costs as well so when you talk about developing curricula and stuff that would fall under basically the operating expenses of the business. So the team of, you know, teachers and curriculum developers and um, makers, designers who go work and create the curriculum together. Okay, thank you. Um, Roya, if I could come back to you now um, with a, a question also about the costs. What are the sure. significant cost items in your business model? They mainly fall the same as what Rosanna was talking about. Um, a large part of it is is rent, basically. Um, but then um, Rosanna mentioned falling under the 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 category of being like a luxury service or a luxury um, um, segment of of what is being provided. And because we cater to adults, a large part of what we do or like what our expenditures come from is um, trying to create that luxury experience. Um, so it's not just the all the typical things that Rosanna had mentioned, but there's also the added layer of making people feel at home and welcome. And um, and a large, a large part of the people that come into our doors, they come in mainly for the crafting. They stay longer for the hospitality and they come back because of the hospitality. Um, so that, that is just like, the, the mini amenities that are there for adults to, to just like sit down and talk. Because at the bottom line, if you're trying to create community, um, you've got the crafting, but um, I don't know if it's the same across the globe, but I think it is where you have to have like 
coffee and food and snacks and things for like people to engage in and with every time they're there. So aside from all the basic, um, all the basic costs that Rosanna highlighted, there's also that added layer of customizing the experience for everybody that comes in. And then each of our workshops, um, we're we're not a one for all situation. We like everybody to go out. Like if everybody is coming in for a candle making workshop, no no two people are walking out with the same product. Um, so they customize from the beginning of the jar the, that they're pouring into to the scent to um, to the color of the candle of like the wax that they're pouring. So there's so many steps to customize, and each of these steps has its own materials. And and because we pride ourselves on on um, individual expression, that is also like another added layer of materials because it's not just the cost of supplies for the workshop; it's the cost of like customizing every single step for people while they're there. Yeah, I understand that. Um, thank you. I also wanted to ask, um, from talking to to both of you, in fact, um, Roya and uh, um, Rosanna, I um, I get the impression you're both extremely passionate about what you do. Um, and I wanted to say to ask how important you think that is in driving the success of of a business model like this. Rosanna, would you like to start? Um, thinking about it, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think, I think especially, especially in the economy that we're in across the globe, if you don't have passion doing what it is you're doing, like if you're an entrepreneur in the creative and arts field, um, that doesn't have passion about what they're doing, you will burn out pretty fast. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned, a lot of people come in for the crafting, but they stay because of the hospitality and they come back because of that. And I am getting it a lot because, because you deal directly one-on-one -on -one with each and each individual that walks into the studio. Um, and to them, they're like, we feel how much you love what you do from the text messages from when we're just like booking the time that we come in. And then that makes people um relaxed and more open to the experience when they're there um so i mean in my opinion passion is just is is an integral part it's like it's the part of what we're doing that's a, a yeah, great think, answer thank you i think i would say the same like um definitely love working with children and teens and meeting their families and just kind of building community and seeing how kind of, uh, you know, this approach to learning by doing, learning through play, learning um, through interest-driven education and STEAM um, just makes such an impact in the lives of children is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, I do think you need passion to to drive, you know, kind of like the community and the business forward um trying to also think that at some point there are perils of passion right and so um continuing um while it's important i think to be resilient right and to strive to do your best um in any endeavor um i feel that there are instances where um Perhaps being too passionate about an idea clouds your judgment about its viability, right? And so you are running yourself to the ground, trying to make ends meet, um, basically running on fumes. And it's important to take pause and to try to think also, are there, are there better and more effective ways to do what you're doing? I know that it makes sense. Um, you know, I was kind of like reading... Uh, Choke Point Capitalism, I'm not sure if you guys have read the book, um, but it talks about basically um, how in creative industries, especially because writers and artists are passionate about their work and they love their work, but they tend to be more prone to exploitation, right? Because they would actually, they love what they do so much that they would do it for free or at very low cost. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, tech giants, um, 
for example, like Amazon or Spotify, take advantage of that passion, right? And so while I do think it is important, I also see it as a peril. And um, while being passionate, I also think you need to be prudent um, and very careful in, in how you decide to, to move the business forward, right? So it's a mix of passion and this kind of reality. I, I would love to second and build up on what Rosanna was saying um, because I fall in that pitfall um, of, of, sometimes, of sometimes the experience uh, it being extremely personal to me. And, and it's like, a, it's like a, I always refer to the studio as like, it's like my mini baby. And so because it's super personal, because um, of how passionate I am about it and, and everything that happens in the studio and the connections that I'm forming while I'm there, um, it also makes it very hard to monetize that um, that feeling. It 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 sort of like creates this not not an imposter syndrome, but this um, but this feeling of but but wait I'm but this is something I'm I'm lucky to be doing something I'm so passionate about and I'm sharing it with people. Am I supposed to be profiting out of this? Um, so it always creates this um, it creates this uh, thought barrier. To, to to properly evaluating your service and and monetizing your service. So I understand 100% what Rosanna is saying. Thank you. Um, just sort of moving, building on that, um, do you ever see a, a tension between the work that you most want to do from um, the passion that you have and the need for to do certain types of work to earn revenue from it or are they pretty well aligned for you in my case they're pretty well aligned um again you're 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 you do this for the long haul. You don't do this for what happens right now. You don't. You don't even do it for what's going to happen in the next year. Uh, you do this for what's going to be happening in the next three years. Um, so. Um, I think we've been lucky so far with them aligning uh, with uh, what your passionate goals are and what brings in money. They're both aligning um, to to open up the market a little bit more on our end. We've started catering to teenagers and above. So instead of just being adults during the summer, we cater to teenagers and above. Um, so it's still in the adults. Um, it's still in the adults realm and we still haven't lost the essence of what we do because in Egypt and I'm pretty sure this is again like a global thing hit teenage age and um, they're they're too young for all the adult activities but they're too old for all the child activities so having something also that is for them um, that makes them feel like the adult that they are like or like on the cusp of adulthood that where they are at um, is also a good thing so that is that is what we've done to counteract the gap between what we're passionate about and how much money we're supposed to be making. Okay, thank you. Um, um, yeah, so I think I think there's definitely a tension um, between the viability of a business um, and perhaps not so much your passion, right? But who you are able to serve through your passion and the business, right? So uh -huh. um, looking at the case of Sparkle Lab and Discovery Academy, yes, I am passionate about, you know, kind of like reimagining the learning experience. Um, I love program development. I love being in touch with kids and teens and their families and just trying to find ways that they can you know, um, find meaning in education, right? And contribute to it um, and become the best people that they can be. But when you think about, and so in that sense, you know, passion and the business model can be aligned. But when you think about passion as the people who you try to serve, right? Inadvertently, if you're going to have to have a business thrive, especially in a country like the Philippines, right? Where you have basically, um such disparities in social economic class, then you know you might be forced to offer your services for those who can pay, right? 
Um, so you're still following your passion, but not quite because it's not accessible to all the kids you would want to reach. Um, and so for me, that's kind of the point where I am in right now, where I would like to continue doing my passion, but make it more egalitarian. And the question is, what kind of business model could be created, right, um, so that you can reach more kids? And it's really tricky, um, especially in something, you know, kind of like making, which is so materials intensive, um, and just need for physical spaces, right? Because I'm a strong <laughs> advocate for for physical spaces in the community you bring, because no matter what, at the end of the day, if you have an app with people sharing, it's not quite the same. And so with costs like rent and building, how can you design a business model where you can sustain your work over time, right? Um, because the goal really is sustainability. It's not so much to make money, but it's so that you aren't a foundation or a nonprofit striving to raise funds all the time in a country where everyone goes to the same three or four funders, obviously more than three or four funders, but it feels like um, basically access to resources is limited. And so you have to find creative ways um, to earn income while doing your passion and kind of doing it for, for everyone and not just for a subsector of society you can pay. Yeah, th thanks for explaining that, Rosanna. I think that's um, um, I think that's a really important point, and I've heard it um, in different guises from um, people talking about different types of business models with maker spaces. That there can quite often be an, an issue um, of making sure that it the services you want to offer are accessible to those who um, who are less able to pay for them. Um, it's an, an ongoing tension, I think. Um, I'd before like to... we move on, oh. sorry, before we move on, I just wanted Please. to build up on something that Rosanna was talking about, which is which is um, the physical spaces and um, the burden, uh, the financial burden of creating these physical spaces. So one thing that Neo does, and I think, I think it's it's been working very well, which is finding. Um, which is finding community partners uh, where we don't, don't pay rent per se, but we revenue share. And we do that with a lot of real estate developers. Mm -hmm. uh, we align ourselves, real estate developers, we align ourselves with um, with large, uh, with large um, uh, consumer and retail um, businesses where they would want to recreate this experience in store to provide like a different in-store experience. So that helps alleviate the pressure of having to pay rent. Um, and and it, it's now it's like a shared responsibility financial wise where um, they help provide um, awareness and marketing and push and, um, and then uh, revenues are split um, according to whatever deal that is built. So that's something we do to to just like try to dissipate as much as possible the rent issue. That's a great idea. And is that um, primarily for the, the sort of corporate events that you run or? Um... Not just for corporate events, but also for the spaces that we've been in. Um, so uh, during the high seasons, for example, uh, we uh, we align ourselves with different developers on across the north coast of, of Egypt because that's where everybody goes to buy the mm. beach. So instead of having yeah. to go and rent out specific spaces, uh, what you do is you form, um, again, because we're in the business of building communities, and that's what mainly what every real estate developer wants is to help bring people in their community together. So if you provide, a, it's sort of like a gym in the area or like a pool. Yep. Um, but instead of it being like a, like, an, like a gym where everybody goes and picks up dumbbells, what everybody is, is, is doing is just like playing with the glitter and having fun. Um, so so that's, that's sort of what we've been doing to, to help lift that up, lift up the burden of rent, basically. I love that concept. I think that was such a a creative way to have um, found another industry whose goals align with yours in that way exactly. to, to help spread the costs. Exactly. Fantastic. And it's not just about sharing the costs. It's also about sharing. Um, it's just like share, not not passions per se, but but community building uh, strategies, mm -hmm. because 
Um, and it's not just um, real estate developers. There's also like large conglomerate stores and department stores where they would want uh, people to come in and stay longer in, the, in their store. So it's kind of like a win-win. They already have people coming in, but we want them or we are able to build the community and people that want to come in and stay there. So combining both together is, is the way we found to be sustainable and to stay open with all the other costs that we have to incur. Brilliant, brilliant, thank you. Um, I'd like to um, bring in some questions um, or, or comments from the audience, please, now. Um, Martin Olu, you have a question. Are you able to unmute and ask that? Martin, I don't know if you can hear me at the moment, but I was just wondering if you could, if you'd like to ask your question. Um, if you don't have, if you're not able to unmute and ask it yourself, then I can read it out as well. Um, um, sorry, um, I was asking on the issue about uh, the price, the the pricing. How easy do the clients you have uh, make their payments? Do they have any difficulties in making payments? For example, I do kids program, but I really find it very difficult to get money from the parents. Yeah. So, um, well, Martin, for us, it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of their it's back to this discussion, right, of kind of uh, who who your market is. Um, and, you know, what we tried in the past with Sparkle Lab was just to have enough kids who paid in full um, to kind of make ends meet and allow us to have um, a lot of kids who, who either came in for free or could pay what they could. Um, but yes, it's, it's definitely difficult. For some parents, it's extremely easy, right? um to pay our fees which are actually you know cheap um but in a country where you know you have extreme poverty and majority of people live on like maybe like three dollars a day um then then it becomes quite difficult um so i completely understand <laughs> and feel for for you um with regard to that yeah so one thing we do, Martin, is make sure we have, again, it's a little bit different because we're, we're talking about adults uh, versus the kids situation. But I think it's, it's one because ultimately whoever ends up paying for the products or like for the workshops or for the time in the, in the lab or in the studio are adults. Um, is try to have as many, um, as many different payment methods as possible. Uh, so there is people can pay online, people can can pay in installments uh, using uh, lots of like reputable uh, uh, businesses where where that that make this possible. We also have a, sort of like a membership um, or like a subscription uh, based thing. You know how when you go buy coffee and they give you a card where you stamp off like if you've been in the studio for like three times then you get your first workshop for free and so on so it's it's about uh, creatively thinking about different payment methods for people and not just the traditional uh, money in exchange for service but like how about if we pack and then people um it's not about liking the a, a deal but people also um want to feel that they could come back and then them coming back is not a financial burden so so that's that's also something that we try to work with. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the question, Martin, and, and thanks for those answers. Um, uh, there's a comment in the chat from Felix on, on that as well, I think. Felix, do you want to, to build on that at all? Okay, um, 
So Felix was just saying that um, something they did that worked some of the time was to allow the people that can pay to pay it forward by donating a ticket to someone that can't afford it. Um, I think that's another interesting and, and creative approach for this. Um, I can see Ronald's got his hand up with a question, but um, Gertrude had also said that she has something. Um, Gertrude, can I come to you next and then I'll come to Ronald after that. Yes, thanks, Anna. Hello, everyone, and a very big thank you to our guests for sharing with us these insights. Sorry, I couldn't join Elia. Um, I'm not sure if you have covered this already, but it's something key that I would really like to know, and I'd appreciate your input on that. Um, in running each of your spaces, I'd like to know if, apart from the team that manages your spaces, if you do have, let's say, um, an advisory board or a supervisory board or a board of directors that also make inputs in the activities of the space. Thank you. Uh, so for us, our board of directors um, basically um, do not give input so much on the programs and the services that we offer, but more on the business model and financial sustainability. Okay, thank you. And it's Roya. Um, no, so that's so ours. Okay. Ours is a very small scale business. It's um, literally a one woman show uh, from 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 the from implementing the workshops and themselves to thinking up what to offer uh, to catering each and every experience. Um, uh but we i do have i wouldn't call them an advisory board but i like not an official advisory board but i do have input um in terms of as rosana said uh, business model and financial development how to grow and so on okay okay thanks for sharing that i'd like to know um from your personal view how has that helped in the growth of your organizations is this something that you'd consider very key to the growth of other maker spaces, or you would say it's something that maker spaces can't do without. What is your personal intake on that? Thank you. Well, in my opinion, it is key, uh, only because of there is only so much that you have knowledge about and can do. And sometimes we we were talking Gertrude before about how you can be so passionate about what you're doing and what you're giving that sometimes you don't see the pitfalls. Um, so it's always nice to have somebody from the outside that also cares for you and cares for your business um, to advise and be like, but hang on, maybe if this was done in this way, it could, it could be better. So yes, having, having support and having an advisory board and having somebody um, that could look from the outside in and sort of, not curb your enthusiasm, but but like point it in the right direction is important. I agree. I think it's integral to have kind of like an advisory board because your you know areas of expertise will obviously diverge. And I think having um a very diverse team of experts with multiple perspectives would be helpful. Um, and especially, you know, kind of trying to help you where you yourself as an individual might be a little bit weaker. Um, so for instance, if it's you need help kind of like with business model development and sustainability, I would say, um, you know, get, get an advisor in that or a set of maybe two or three advisors. Um, if you need help in marketing, um, then definitely get someone to help you with marketing and advocacy and kind of telling the story of your hub or your makerspace or your community uh, center. Um, it could be in kind of like operations or even like procurement. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think the more, the more people that help you out, um, the better. Um, but also like know that you will probably ultimately have to make, you know, decisions based on their input um, yourself or with your team. Thank you very much for the question and, and for those answers. Um, I'd like to come to Ronald now who has his hand up with a question. Um, Ronald, would you like to unmute and, and ask? 
Mm. Or question or a comment, uh, sorry. Hello. Yeah, uh, hi. Okay, yeah, so uh, you have a question. Uh, so my question, I think it was Roya who mentioned something about uh, a co-working space for creatives. So at Eyes on Hub, we are currently looking at building communities around uh, creatives of different, uh, yeah, just, just people who are just interested in making things and all that. So when you mentioned that, I kind of had a question, like, what, what does this co-working co -working space include, like in terms of how does it cater for different creatives? Is it for a specific group of creatives or it's for different, for, for different groups of creatives? Because you'd find if someone maybe is a carpenter or someone who makes candles, as you were saying, these people will require different, maybe uh, machinery to do what they are doing. So I just wanted to ask, well, what does this co-working space for, for creatives in your own context look like in terms of the services that you offer and the support that you offer to these creatives and are they like paying for the service up front or they'll pay after uh, maybe after they've like gone like shipped out their first uh, page of product or something like that okay so and to answer your question Arnold um the the idea behind the the co-working system like what we provide is it's it's something for everybody. So if you if you are interested in fiber arts, then you'd have all the all the supplies and all the things you need for fiber arts. If you're interested in candle making, then you find all the supplies and tools for candle making. If you're interested in um, carpentry and and making uh, pipe um, and just like making pipe ornaments and pipe uh, home decor, uh, you would also find that. Um, so so that's in terms of like what is in the studio um as for as for how do they pay if they if they don't know anything about what what they're what what they would like to learn like if somebody let's take let's take candle making for example so if somebody doesn't know um anything about candle making but they think it's a cool business to start uh, they come in and they pay the first time full uh, workshop price for the uh, for the knowledge that they're getting for the know-how um, for for sharing resources like we're not we're not one to like hide our resources from people that actually want to start their own businesses so they get all of that the first time when they pay full price for the workshop and then later on and and if she wants to come back and try her hand at making uh, for example 10 candles and trying to sell them what she does then is only pay for the price of material and that's it. She already has the know-how. She already knows everything. It's kind of like um, office hours in a in a school or university, where um, during class you took all the you took all the information. But if you want to come back and, and you have and you want to like apply it, um, I'm there for people to ask questions or keep an eye out or or just like guide from afar. Um, but um, but essentially, she's she's a maker now, and she can she can create what she wants. And what she pays for is just the price of uh, of supplies. Um, in terms of how they pay, um, that is honestly done on a on a base to base uh, situation. Uh, some people can afford to pay upfront, and they'll be like, "I will pay for this upfront." And some people can. Um, a lot of the time, uh, I mentioned earlier that we like to work with underprivileged women. Um, so a lot of the time, they do not have the money up front for supplies. Um, and we work closely with uh, women organizations and we work closely with uh, the National Organization for Women here in Egypt, uh, where they could either um, send and, and sponsor these women or um or we help launch them and and in that case they also get the knowledge of how to run an online business how to open up a instagram page to sell from it how to open up a facebook page and so on um so they also get that they get how to how to photograph uh, their pictures um and make them more aesthetic because their win is our win um so and and with these um we like to we like to do one of two things if if they want to, to if they want to pay later on for the price of all the supplies that they use then that's great but also if they want to um, to offer a percentage of revenue versus instead of instead of the price of the supplies that they're using that is also an option so again it goes back to every single step not just customizing what people do but customizing how they pay according to their needs and, and what they can afford does that answer your question yes 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 thank you so much so, uh, uh, 
Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that, Ronald. Um, there's there's lots of um, activity going on in the chat as well, so I'm hoping that I'm um, keeping up with it all. I do apologise if I've missed any questions there. Um, do feel free to shout out again. Um, but I can see there's a, a question from Kirsten about um, paying the advisory board um, and whether you advertise for the posts in specific skill sets. Um, I think Rosanna has already um, answered that a bit in the chat. So Roya, could we please just um, bring that question to you as well? It's... With paying my advisory board? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay, so my advisory board is i'm i'm lucky i a lot of industry leaders i would call personal friends um so i've been lucky in that regard where where we get to bounce around ideas and we get to they get to give me that um outside outside view of but wait hold up maybe this would be better or or so on um so i've been lucky in that regard where i don't pay my advisory board <laughs> Okay. And it sounds like perhaps you didn't advertise for specific skill sets either. It's rather that you've been um, chosen by you because they're people that you whose opinions you respect. Exactly. It's not just about respecting, but it's also about trusting their opinions. Mm -hmm. um, with with a with a passion project, with any passion project, um, it's 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 a very personal it's a very personal experience. And and to hand out advice, it's kind. I always link it to to being a single mom. Uh, to a to a newborn, um, so to hand out like um, and to listen to let's call it parenting advice from anybody, it has to be somebody that knows you well and knows um, and knows how to like align uh, their goals to or like your goals with where you want to go. And again, not curb your enthusiasm per se, but sort of like guide it properly. Um, so yeah, that's a great, great. analogy. I like that a lot. Um, Rosanna, I know that you um, answered that question, I think, in the chat, but I'm just wondering if there's anything that you wanted to, to add on to that um, about the, the handpicked advisors. Uh, no, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. Like what I said earlier, getting, um, I guess, like a diverse group of experts with uh, divergent skill sets, but also points of view um, is essential. But ultimately, you and your team will have to make an informed decision, right? as to the advice that you will choose to keep. Um, and um, I guess what what kind of works for your organization at the end of the day. Great, thank you. I think if there's um, an I'm outcome out of this conversation is there really is no right way to do um, to do this. There, there, there really isn't. It's, it's, again, it's a passion project. And I think Rosanna said it very well with so long as you have your target audience and the people you want to serve at the core of everything that you're doing, then you're probably doing it right. Um, I'd, I'd agree with that. And that's, that line of thinking is exactly why we wanted to make these um, discussions rather than kind of webinars or something where you, um, you hear the right way of doing it from somebody because I think that um, there's huge value in getting insights from hearing the different ways that people are doing it, but it doesn't mean that you need to apply that in, um, you know, as a whole in any way, but it can help spark your own ideas. Exactly. And I think essentially that's like the hardest thing about what we do is because there is no rule book. You are writing the rule book as you go along. And, and because each business or each passion project or each lab or each studio is essentially very different than the other one. So you can't, it's not like you can go on Google and be like business models for successful, whatever. Um, so, so that in essence is why what we do is so hard um, because you're writing the rule book as you go along. Like in my case, hospitality and experience uh, was very essential and fundamental to what I offer. So I had to I had to study a lot about hospitality and I read books and 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 I read I read things like the Disney um, experience book, like Be Our Guest, because, you know, everybody loves Disney and everybody loves that. And then you read about hosp hospitality management and I've read books by um, by Marriott and I've read and I've read a lot of books. So what I'm trying to say is you you 
you put your target audience at the heart of what you want to provide and then you put the experience that you want in front of you and then you just study really hard and try to mesh both together to come up with the ultimate formula that works for you and works for your audience and i guess um that'll be why you have made your title experience director is that right Roya? because you really are putting exactly. that at the center of what you're creating exactly if people again um they come in for the crafting first time around next time around and the third and the fourth time around they come in for the hospitality and for um the warm welcome that they find um which in a world where where because we, we cater to adults so in a world where everybody is super stressed um the other day somebody was like i'm in love with the place because you told us we don't have to be on time to come into the workshop and that is how stressed adults are um so so yeah yeah uh, i'd like to come to a question from shakira um about marketing um shakira if you are able to unmute and would like to ask it yourself, feel free to come in. Um, otherwise, I'll just um, read what it says in the chat, which is, um, I've heard you talking about marketing. What are some of the ways through which you market your products? Hello. Hello. I uh, wanted to know some of the ways that you use to market your products. And someone already answered that. Okay, hey, I think um, I think Rosanna has answered it in the chat, um, saying that the community is itself is the biggest asset. Um, Roya, I just wonder if you've got anything to add on that. It's one hundred percent true. Word of mouth is one of the key operating factors when it comes to people walking into the studio. Um, and then you've got your your traditional uh, online marketing and social media marketing that you can do, but um, word of mouth is at the base and essential part of it. Okay. Are there any more questions or comments or additions from the uh, from the audience, please? If there are, please raise your hand or, or type them in the chat. Um, I, I don't see anything else at the moment. Um, a question that I have um, that I'd like to put um, first of all to Rosanna, please, and, and then I'll come to you, Roya, is um, if you if you were starting out again, what advice would you give yourself? Um, or what do you wish you'd known earlier in your journey? Wow, that's a that's a great question. Um, yeah, I guess on my part, um, You know, I am definitely strongest in kind of like the programmatic side of the business, like so creating programs and products and services, experiences for young people um, and their families. I guess um, probably being more cognizant of different models from the get-go um, and um, what it would mean for the vision of the organization, you know, moving forward um, would have been, I think, a great thing um, to have. Maybe partnering also with someone with more expertise on the business side um, early on um, so that I could focus kind of on research and development and that person could focus on business development, I think would have been um, ideal. Uh, you know, that said, I guess like in the Philippines, but probably in other places as well, um, it's quite difficult um, to sustain something um, uh, as a business. You know, you're constantly trying to, to create value for shareholders, right? Um, so when that becomes the goal, then sometimes the community suffers as well. And so are there alternate business models and ways um, that it can be done, especially in low income countries, right? Um, I think it's different when you talk about uh, middle and high income countries, because inadvertently, um, you're able to serve most of the population who are middle class. What I haven't seen really is a sustainable model um, in the global south. 
that allows kids and teens to create um, um, in a way that is sustainable and not dependent on funding from international aid agencies, um, international organizations and stuff. Um, so um, yeah, I would say probably um, educating myself a bit more about business models, but also finding a partner who is passionate and loves wrapping his or her head around uh, these kind of problems would have been fantastic um, to have from the get-go. That's a great answer. Thank you very much for those, those insights, Rosanna. Um, Roya, can I come to you? Same question, please. Sure. Um, so I was actually thinking about what my answer would be when Rosanna was talking. And aside, um, I think I think what I would have done was started sooner. Um, you, again, as a creative, um, you you get in your head a lot and you stand in your way a lot. Um, you will never have everything figured out, like ever. Um, you will never be able to forestall and, and think and, and plan every single pitfall that could happen. Um, and you just you just you take it with stride and if it's something i would have done it would be just start sooner um just know have the skill set that you need um and and just like i would have jumped in and done this sooner that's really good to hear and i think that's yeah. a very um very positive message um, there's another question in the chat um, from Martin um, about is keeping several revenue models the secret to financial sustainability? Um, what are your th thoughts on that, Roya? Um, do you mean in terms of different offerings that we do? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so if I'm understanding the question properly, in, in our case, we have business to business. So we'll be both corporates. And then we also have business to consumers. And then we also have um, uh, people that, that, are, that are makers and they want to start their own businesses. And we also, um, and we also have our own product line um, that will be launching soon. Um, but, but like diversifying and having different revenue streams definitely helps in, um, in an economy such as Egypt, uh, where everything is unpredictable, um, trying to have your bases covered one way or another is smart and prudent when, when, when operating a business like this, because a business like this just has so many variables and you're juggling so many balls. Um, so if you can generate income from different ways and, and, one thing we found that generates income, although we love physical spaces, but one thing we found, which is having a digital, um, um, having something sellable that is digital is also a great way to, to generate passive income. Um, it's still essentially at the core of what you do. So if it's like a candle making workshop or if it's, um, it's like an online workshop where people can buy online and do at their own time instead of having to commute and come into the space, you've also opened up markets to, to worldwide where, where you're shipping out kits um, or sending out a recommended um, list of supplies to people. Again, it's in the essence of what you do, which is sharing your knowledge with people and creating makers no matter where they are in the globe. Uh, but having a digital product also helps uh, generating passive income. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Rosanna, you mentioned in the chat that you think it definitely helps. Is there anything you'd like to build on there? And I'm also curious yeah. as to whether you've got any experience with digital products, as Roya mentioned. Um, no, I think it definitely helps having different revenue streams. Um, I think one thing that's important to note is that you are limited in terms of your resources, right? Especially your team. And so you don't want to spread yourself too thin by having, you know, four revenue models, right? And then sacrificing program quality or the quality of your products and services. Um, and so I think there's a delicate balance there that has to be navigated. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, Kirsten, I can see you've just posted a, another question. Would you like to come in and, and ask that? Yes, sure. Uh, thanks for the very interesting session. Um, what I was wondering, um, just <clears throat> taking my notes, one of the most interesting things I think um, 
with Roya when you were talking about, you know, sharing the space and using other types of collaborators, such as the developers. And um, I was just wondering when it comes to that type of engagement with them, do you need to provide, you know, the frowny face of uh, KPIs, data sets of how many people came in and stipulate that, which is, you know, many, many times what the NGO categories have to go through or any CSR um, type of elements. Um, so I just thought as something quite interesting um, as a, a different model, what, what is your experience there? Is it flexible? And yeah, how, how do you navigate that? Okay, so yes, definitely. You have to present um, numbers. Again, um, a business or like a real estate developer at the bottom line is a business. You're the one that's bringing in the passion. They're the business. Um, so they would want to see numbers. They want to see how many people walk through your door. Um, an important number because you're stressing community. So an important number to always have on hand is how many peak customers come in. Um, so, so that is also a very important number for you to have. If you don't have a database where, where you're capitalizing on that and you're building on that, then please start one right now. Um, another thing that's very important and something I like to do at the beginning when I'm, when I'm meeting people is always ask how you heard about us or how you know about us. Um, and then take note of that because that also goes into an Excel where, okay, this was word of mouth. This came from uh, this came from a referral. This came from online or like um, social media advertising. Like this is where everything comes from. And these are figures and numbers that developers want to see. Um, they want to see how diverse the people that come into the um, into the studio are, or like into your space are. Uh, diverse in in terms of like age range. Like what what uh, what age gap are you able to uh, to satisfy, and what age gap are you able to cover? Um, um, basically, any demographics that you have is is very important for for a developer to look at and see. And that pertains to community building, such as how many people come in. Uh, how many people were referrals, how many people are repeat customers. Uh, that is also a very, very important figure uh, in, in for them because that is basically in essence what they're partnering up with you to do. So you need to, um, you need to have like proven record of that happening. Even if it's a very small number, like when we first started, it was a very small number. Um, and we're now up to a 46% of our customers on a monthly basis are people that are repeat customers. And that is a very important, um, and that's a very important number for, for people to look at, especially when you're building a community. Does that answer your question? Oh, sorry, I was just fighting the, the mute, unmute. <laughs> I know that, that gives a lot of insight. No, that, that helps because, I mean, I think a lot of people are used to approaching funders and things like that, but um, finding out a little bit more about the business model in that context was really interesting. So thank you. So also um, to note, it's not just real estate developers, like um, like approaching large department stores and offering them uh, ways to to, um, to keep people in store is also very creative. And then what you would want to do is, um, so if it's a department store that sells luxury project, uh, products and, and one of them is, I don't know, like a concrete catch-all for like a decor piece. And if you, if you suggest like, I will, I will show your people how to do this, that is also something that, that they would want to do. Everybody right now is, is like the entire world is shifting into like a, and a DIY mindset and into an experience mindset um, versus people just wanting to go and buy. Um, a lot of people want to be involved in the process, want to learn, want to not just watch a maker do something versus sitting down and doing it themselves, even if it sucks and even if it's horrible in the end, but it's the experience itself. I really agree with that. Thank you. Um, we're going to need to wrap up in the next few minutes. Um, I in a couple of minutes time, I'm just going to come to each of our speakers and ask if you've got any um, anything else you'd like to share, a closing message or, or something like that. Um, but in, in the meantime, um, I just wanted to let people know that this is a series of discussions um, and that there will be another one next month and every month um, until uh, at least November. And we're having them on the third Wednesday. Um, of each month at uh, normally at 1 p.m. UTC. The topic that we've selected for next month is around um, recycling and circular economy. So I think that will be another very interesting discussion. 
Um, I just wanted to say how much I've loved today's discussion. Um, it's been so interesting and I um, I love the fact that we've we've covered everything from um, the the community and the creativity and the passion side of things through to the need to collect hard data and um, to put your KPIs in a spreadsheet um, and, and these kind of things. And I think there's been some really amazing insights that have come from both of our speakers, um, Roya and Rosanna. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and um, this... Uh, these series of discussions um, are being done in partnership with the MAKE project and Gwenda, thank you so much, she just posted the, um, the uh, web address in the chat that, where you can subscribe to the newsletter and you can hear about future, um, uh, future editions of these as well as all the other things that the project is up to. Um, so thank you all very much for joining and thank you very much indeed to our two speakers, to Roya Zanati and to Rosanna Lopez um, and Roya, any quick closing remarks from your side, please? Um, I think I, I said it before, but um, but knowing going in um, that that this isn't this isn't the business where you get um, instant. Um, I mean, there is no business where you get instant like a gratification, instant money from. But this is you're in a business for people and with people um and and you just have to like really be prepared for the long haul um be prepared for a lot and a lot of downs um but also when the highs hit they're they're really special um and getting to talk and share a mini part of my journey with all of you is a high so thank you for that opportunity and um and just just i don't know just buckle up and enjoy and enjoy whatever it just like take the leap it's a leap of faith um um i was given this advice a lot and i never listened to it but it's just like just start just start somewhere just start with your friends um just start just just start just jump in and start because waiting for the perfect opportunity or because i was stuck in there um and now if it's anything it's like why didn't i just start sooner um so that that's that's what i would love to leave everybody with Great closing words. Thank you, Roya. Um, Rosanna, any any final thoughts from your side, please? Yeah, I just absolutely love being part of this conversation. And I think there's a lot of things for me to think about. Um, you know, I'm trying to, um, yeah, just in terms of like business models, um, I think for the most part, people who work with communities are extremely passionate about what they want to do. So finding a business model actually isn't about revenue. It's about sustainability, right? Yeah. Um, and I think um, just being able to continue touching the lives of, you know, like parents, kids, or whoever you work with, it could be adults, like in Roya's case, um, is so integral to, to the work. That said, um, you know, I think... Well, with at least in the Philippine context, it's very difficult to have a business model when um, it basically um, it's very consumer oriented, right? Um, and if your consumers don't have purchasing power, it kind of leaves them behind. Um, so even in the case of you know, rent sharing, in, in theory, it's wonderful to have um, maybe developers want you to share a space um, or department stores. But in the Philippine context, developers only want people with a certain amount of purchasing power in their spaces to begin with, right? Um, and if they don't have that kind of purchasing power, not only will they not be wanted in those communities, right? But it also makes it difficult um, um, and so I think, I think just kind of, you know, thinking through these problems and issues, right? Um, if your society is structured around um, just creating revenue and increased value for shareholders and kind of catering to consumers, then it becomes difficult to reach everyone equitably. Um, mm -hmm. I have yet to see a business model um, that is successful in reaching a lot of people at low cost. 
Um, I would love to learn more about that and attend further talks. And I think, you know, the value, I guess, of these sessions is not to come up with an answer, but together to think things through. And hopefully through our concerted efforts and knowledge sharing, we'll be able to find better ways. It's a perfect note to end on. Um, thank you very much. Um, so thank you again to, to our wonderful speakers um, for sharing your wisdom and your insights. And thank you to all, all of our participants and for the for questions and for sharing your own experiences. So um, there are links in the chat um, to the MAKE website and to um, the various different social media handles. So please do feel free to have a look at those. And I hope you'll join us again next month on the third Wednesday again um, for the one about recycling. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you and bye.